in chapter 1, we talked about last week what God has done for us. And so remember, God the Father chose us, God the Son redeemed us, and God the Holy Spirit seals us. And then Paul closes the chapter with a prayer that we didn't get to look at in very much detail last week when he prayed for them to kind of understand everything that they had in Christ, a very spiritual prayer. So that's what you have in chapter 1. And again, there is so much there. There is no way we could do justice to chapter 1 in the short duration of time that we had together because I spent so much time just on introductory issues, right? And so if chapter 1 is what God has done for us, Chapter 2 is what God has done in us, verses 1 through 10. And by the way, the key word there is grace, which kind of ties into what we've been talking about in regular church, doesn't it? And then in verses 11 through 22, he begins to talk about what God has done between us. Tonight, we're going to talk about what God has done in us, verses 1 through 10. And then verses 11 through 22, what God has done between us. He carries that on into chapter 3. And we'll talk about that next week uh, when we meet together. So anyway, let's look at chapter 2 together and we'll dive right into this. Uh, Let me read the first 10 verses together and we'll talk about that and then we'll do uh, the second portion a little bit later, okay? So Paul says this, he says, and you were dead, underline that word, that's a key word in the text, in your trespasses and sins. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Verse 4, underline this, but God... You guys see that? All right. Some of you might be football fans. Let me give you a football analogy here. Um, Your defense is on the field. The offense is driving against your defense, and it looks like they're getting ready to score. The opposing team throws a pass, and not only do you intercept the ball, but you take it back down the other direction for what we call a pick six. Everybody tracking with me? A pick six is a play in which one team looks like they're getting ready to score and they're moving down the field, but the other team in one play gets the ball and takes it all the way back for six points. Everybody tracking with me? So that's a big reverse play. Verse four is a pick six kind of statement when the Bible says, but God, okay? And uh, youth pastors talk to their youth groups all the time and they make jokes about the big butts that are in the Bible, you know, and things of that nature. This is one of those huge, huge moments where in the first three verses, Paul is talking about us and our depravity. And then verse four, here's the grace. That's where we were. Now here's the but God question. So look at it. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, there it is a second time, we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And then in parentheses, by grace you have been saved. Okay? And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why did he do that? So that... In the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And then the famous verse that many of you have memorized. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. All right, let's stop right there and let's discuss these first 10 verses together before we look at verses 11 through 22 because in verses 11 through 22, the subject matter does change. One of the issues that we'll talk about in the second part of the chapter is a very practical issue And that is you had Gentiles that were being saved 
You guys remember, even in the early church, in the book of Acts, as the Jewish church gave way to the inclusion of Gentiles, there were some growth pains, not only within the church, but get this, a guy like Peter, who struggled with the fact that, you know, Gentiles are being saved. And of course, Paul was called on the carpet numerous times because Gentiles were being saved. And so um, in the Ephesian church, one of the practical things that Paul is addressing is the fact that Gentiles have been saved, added to the body of Christ, and have all of the same blessings that came and come through Abraham's descendants, the Jews. Are y'all tracking with me? So in verses 11 through 22, there's this, even though it's all theological in nature, in, in terms, terms of Paul talking about this is who you are in Christ, these are the blessings you have in Christ, and he never says, so you Jews and Gentiles get along. He never comes out and says that, even though it's more uh, theology in terms of nature, that is the practical application. And so we are going to talk about that here in just a moment. But before he gets to that, he wants to teach the Ephesians not only all the blessings that they have in Christ, but also the blessing of salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ Jesus. So he begins by teaching them um, in verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So again, you've got this idea of being dead. Now he mentions the word dead again. I told you to underline it, at least in your mind and in your heart. He goes on and he says again, there a little bit later uh, in uh, the chapter, verse five, and you were dead in your transgressions. So two different times he lets us know and he lets the Ephesian believers know we were dead uh, before God came along and by grace saved us, okay? So um, when we get to verse four, the but God verse, but God who's rich in mercy, and we just start standing back and praising God for how good he's been in terms of our salvation. Before we get there, you've got to set the backdrop with verses one through three. It, uh, the way I describe it sometimes, it's like going shopping at a um, jewelry store. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I've never um, had that much money uh, to go into really nice jewelry stores, but I have been in a few of them. Um, actually, Cubic Zirconia and those types of stores are <laughs> more my speed. But anyway, um, you go into a jewelry store and you guys know there's usually some velvety background. It's usually kind of a dark crimson, oftentimes just black velvety background. And they display whatever you're looking at whether it be earrings or rings or whatever, necklaces, and especially the jewels, whatever jewels they are, even diamonds, things like that. They display those things with those dark backgrounds. And of course, the, 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 the glass is always crystal clear and clean, and then they have lights, right? So the point is, is that the reason you've got the dark background is so that, and the light's hitting the gold or the, the, the diamonds or whatever, is so that you will pay attention not to the background. In fact, they want everything in the background to fade away. They want you to see the jewel, right? They want you to see the diamond. They, they want you to see how that thing sparkles, how that gold glistens and how that silver shines and things like that. And so um, before you get to verse four, talking about here's what God did, the wonders of his grace. He loved us he, and by grace are we saved. And he reached down even while we were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul puts up the backdrop of our depravity first. And he, and he, he declares to us where we were before we got saved. Now, again, one of the problems with the church today and a lot of problems with people out there um, stem from the fact we have too low a view of God and too high a view of ourselves. Um, if you listen, for example, to country and Western music, um, you'll find out that um, there's a lot of talk about God and faith and things of that nature, but generally in a lot of those songs, and this is, I'm not picking on any particular um, country song that I'm thinking of right now, but generally the idea is you know, we're good old boys, um, and, you know, we honor the man upstairs, 
he's kind of the man upstairs and I don't have really have a problem with him and he doesn't really have a problem with me. That's kind of the, the God of country and Western. Um, and so um, that idea is pervasive in many minds, especially here in the Bible Belt and here in the Midwest or South, however you want to describe where we're at. You have a lot of people that just kind of feel like, hey, God's good. He's up there. I believe in him. He kind of grades on a curve. Um, and by the way, I'm not a bad person. So I'm not an Adolf Hitler. I'm not a Joseph Stalin. I'm not a Timothy McVeigh or a Terry Nichols or some monster that would commit egregious acts. I've never murdered anybody. I've never raped anybody. I'm not a pimp player, thug, or hustler that's in prison. You know, I'm generally a good guy. And again, most people think I'm a red-blooded American. I'm, uh, for many people, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. Um, I pay my taxes. I raise my kids. Um, and I don't cuss very often. <laughs> and if I do, it's not that bad. I don't take God's name in vain, you know. And so their idea is, is that, you know, it, it, my problem is not that big. Uh, and you guys know because you've been in church a while and you know what the scripture says. When you actually look at the description of what God says about humanity outside of Christ, those that are lost, it is terribly, terribly different than most, what most people think about themselves. We use a term in theology called depravity. Somebody's depraved. We, we use a term in theology that says not just depraved, but totally depraved. Now, um, you guys might know if you have a vehicle that's worth a certain amount of money and there's an accident, if they come in and the damage is more than the vehicle's worth, they total that vehicle, right? It means that it is beyond repair, essentially. And so when we use the word total depravity, what we're saying is, is we're sinners that are beyond repair. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're all as bad as we could be, but what it does mean is that we are corrupt in our natures. We receive from Adam this thing called a sin nature. Theologians can discuss and debate about how exactly um, we get that. But the point is, is that we receive, because we're in Adam, this sin nature. We are sinners by choice. In other words, the moment I come to what's called the age of accountability, if we want to use that terminology, I will willfully sin. But it's not just that I'm a sinner because of what I do. I'm a sinner because of the way I think, because of my nature. I have a proclivity in me towards sin. Um, one of the things that you guys know, because I know many of you are grandparents, and so you know this about your kids or your, grand, your grandkids, you don't have to teach them to do wrong. I, don't, I didn't have to teach Christian how to lie. I didn't have to teach them how to be disrespectful and that kind of thing. That is just in him. In fact, if somebody doesn't believe in the total depravity of man, then that's probably a person that's never had a child before. <laughs> because you have a child and you realize, man, I, you know, what, where's that coming from? Well, our understanding and view of anthropology or man is that man is a depraved sinner. And what Paul is trying to do in Ephesians 1 through 3, before he starts talking about the goodness of God, he sets the backdrop of humanity warts and all. And so there we are. It's ugly. In fact, he says, you guys, and I'm going to use this terminology, you before you got saved, and this is all of us, not just somebody that maybe was a drunkard or a prostitute and got saved, all of us, even if you considered yourself a good person, and even if you were saved at the wonderful age of eight years old, all of us, according to Paul, whether saved at six or 60, whether we were um, repenting of talking back to our parents or whether we were repenting of murder or whatever it might be, whatever degree of sin, Paul says you were dead in trespasses and sins. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but um, over the last, it seems like, I'm going to say decade, but probably more, there's been a fascination with zombie movies. I, you know, it just seems like all of these zombie movies and uh, television shows and things like that. 
That's really, when you look at this text, what Paul is saying is, is that a lost person in many ways is a walking zombie. They're alive physically, but spiritually, they're dead. In fact, when I got here, the former youth pastor that was here before Alex, and actually the former one before the youth pastor that was here when I got here, so two youth pastors ago had some shirts made for the youth, and um, it had this text on there, and it had a kind of a funny-looking zombie on it walking, and the shirt something, said something to, to the degree that, we're not zombies or something like that. But um, they had picked up on this text that says, you, again, before you're saved, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, the theological, and, and again, he says that again in verse five, the theological discussion, oftentimes when it comes to talking about, does the Bible say we're all sinners? Everybody's gonna say yes. Does the Bible say that um, we've broken the commandments, the, Yes, nobody's going to question that. The Bible says we've received a corrupt nature from Adam. Everybody's going to say yes. There might be some debate about whether we, we receive the guilt of Adam at birth or whether we become guilty later as we sin against God. That's all within uh, the reasoning of what it means to be a sinner. None of us are going to question much of that. The question is, is what does it mean to be dead in sin. And the Bible says here we're dead in your trespasses and sins. They're going to say we're dead like Lazarus was dead in the fact that we cannot respond to God in any way. Are you all tracking with me? And so therefore for God to save somebody, and this is how they define being dead, for God to save somebody, he must, even before they hear the gospel, he must by the Holy Spirit come make them alive, okay? Uh, we use the term regenerate them, make them alive. Spiritually, they're a corpse. And like Lazarus, unless Jesus calls and says, Lazarus comes forth, come forth, they cannot wake up and hear the gospel in terms of being able to understand it and respond to him. Do you guys remember I wrote a word up last week, the word ordo salutis, order of salvation? So what they have is they have regeneration, God making a person alive first. Then they have repentance and faith. The question is, is what does being dead in trespasses and sins mean? Does it mean your corpse lack dead and you're unable to respond to God unless he makes you alive? Or does it mean something else? Paul says we're dead in trespasses and sins. He's using metaphor. This is language that is not literal, but it's a metaphor. So it is a, a, a word that is used to mean something and to picture something, okay? And so it's metaphorical language. And so um, what is being dead in the scripture? By the way, um, there is a, a gospel where the word dead is used for somebody. In fact, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. The prodigal son who was lost was dead, but now he's alive. Are y'all tracking with me? So let me tell you what I believe the word dead means in this context and in other places in the text. The word dead means to be separated. In fact, that's what it means even physically. Uh, we have a funeral coming up Tuesday, and as you guys know, um, when death occurs, when somebody is dead, what you have is you have the spirit or the soul separating from the body. And so the spirit is not there, the human spirit is not there to animate the body. And so death is actually separation, okay? And so basically when Paul says here that we're dead in trespasses and sins, I think he's using it the way that the prodigal son was dead to the father. He was alive physically, but he was separated from his father. And so the word dead here in trespasses and sins means that we're separated from God in our sins and our trespasses. And so I don't believe that one has to be regenerated or made alive in that condition in order to have faith 
or repent. But I believe that every person, even that is dead in trespasses and sins, when they hear the gospel, which has power in it and grace within the gospel itself, they have, are you ready for this? The ability then to respond to God. And when they respond to God and repent and put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, then that's when either simultaneously right at that moment or following it right after that, that's when they are regenerated or made alive. But right here, it's not just the mercy of God, it is the love of God. And so there's something in him, not in us. We're dead in trespasses and sins, but there's something in him that causes him to act towards us in salvation. By the way, uh, verse 5 says in parentheses, for by grace you've been saved. Um, that been saved is in what we call the perfect tense in the Greek language. Let, let, let me give you this. This is worth, worth taking a second for. The perfect tense in the Greek language is something that's happened in the past with ongoing results. Okay? In fact, ongoing results to the next day and really forever and ever. Uh, I could say I shut the door in the perfect tense and the idea is I shut the door and that door is closed right now and it's going to be closed tomorrow. Are y'all tracking with me? That's perfect tense. An aorist tense is just something you do in the past. This is not an aorist. We were saved. Perfect tense. What that means is, again, it's beautiful. Uh, we were saved by grace. We were saved and we're not only saved for a duration of time, we're saved today we're going to be saved tomorrow because of what Christ Jesus did for us in terms of salvation. By the way, even that tense right there is um, contradictory to what many people believe in terms of them saying that you can lose your salvation. No, we're saved perfect tense. If he saved me in 1990 and I'm saved today, I'm going to be saved tomorrow by his grace. Okay? And... He raised us up with him. Now remember, we're placed in Christ. So he raised us up with him. That's new life. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay? So we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now, don't forget, physically, we're in Coeta. Spiritually, we're seated with him on the throne. Just think about that for just a moment. Think about your position in Christ. So that, this is God just being good, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you what that text is saying in verse 7. The reason he does all this is so throughout all of eternity um, he can display his wonderful grace and his mercy and his love. Throughout all of eternity we are, are you ready for this terminology? trophies of God's grace. Think about that for just a moment. Um, the church, which has both Jews and Gentiles in it throughout all of eternity, people are going to look at the church and say, you're a trophy of God's grace. Hey, check this out. You remember the angels that sinned against God and rebelled? Lucifer, Satan, sinned against God and he drew a number of the angels to follow him. Do you realize that they were cast down and they were given no second opportunity for salvation. Satan's lot is sealed. But when it comes to humanity, even though we were um, in the garden in Adam and Eve, and we sinned against God, and we fell, and we're sinners by nature and by choice, even though all of that, God, however, gives us grace. And he saves us, and then throughout all of eternity, we're going to stand as trophies of his grace they're going to look at you and say god is merciful and how do i know god is merciful because you're in heaven right now that's how i know god is merciful and so that's an awesome awesome verse trophies of god's grace then he says in verse eight for by grace that's unmerited favor of god you've been saved through what faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god um not a result of work so that no one may boast. Paul uses for both grace and faith feminine nouns. And when he says it is the gift of God, 
that's in the neutral or the neuter, okay? And so what I'm trying to say is, is when he says it is the gift of God, he doesn't put it in the feminine, which means he's not just talking about grace and faith. He's not saying faith is a gift from God. He's saying that the whole shebang, all of salvation is what is a gift from God. Are you guys tracking with me? And so for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is what is the it, the whole thing, salvation. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, one of the major principles in Galatians, Romans, Ephesians is this. Salvation is by grace through faith. And here's the reason why God makes it that way. So that if you believe in Christ and you are placed in Christ and you receive all of these blessings... Only God can get the glory for it. And so that's why he says, so that no one, it's not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. If there was one thing you could do to earn or merit or gain your salvation, you would have something to, to, to boast about. But because you can't do anything to earn it or merit, or merit it or gain it, um, and it's simply by faith, then only God can get the glory for it. And so it's all about who's going to get the glory for your salvation so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, you guys know that works do not contribute to your salvation. However, God saves you so that you might do good works. Are y'all tracking with me? That's where works figure into the to the Christian life. In fact, the Bible says work out your own salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. So in other words, because we've been saved by grace through faith, because of what he's done in me, therefore I'm going to do good things. Okay? Now, this is beautiful. Now, just follow with, track with me in the chapter. You're dead in sins. You're a depraved sinner. But God, because of his grace, saves you, raises you up. He not only loves you, he lifts you. And uh, then he lavishes up on you all the blessings that are in Christ because he's grace, gracious and because of his mercy. And um, he wants to make you a trophy of God's grace. And the reason he doesn't like that, gives you salvation like that, is so you can't brag about it. All you can do is brag about him. And get this, you're his workmanship. The Greek word there is poemi. Poemi. We derive our English word poem from it and what God is saying is is that you are a beautiful work of God's grace and you were created to do good works he saves you simply by grace through faith so that you can turn around and God can write with your life a beautiful story of how good he is in salvation which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in in them. Oh, contrast that word walk in those good works with how we walk before. How did he say we walk before? We walk like dead zombies according to the, the world and the spirit of this, this world and that kind of thing. But now he says, now I prepared you for good works so that you would walk in them. So verses 1 through 10 are, in my estimation, some of the greatest verses on where we were B.C., before Christ, how we are in Christ by grace through faith, and the blessings that follow and the good works that we do as a result of being in Christ. And it's all hinging upon but God. But it's not us, it's just His goodness, and that's the way that He designed it. Here is how a person is saved in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, in any dispensation that you want to point out, going into the New Covenant, New Testament, nowadays, even into the future millennial kingdom, a person is always saved in the Bible by grace through faith. That's always. And that's, remember, that's what Paul is arguing in Romans with Abraham. How was Abraham saved? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so salvation in the Bible is always the same way by grace you are saved through faith. The Jews in the Old Testament, the Hebrews uh, in the Old Testament that were saved, they were saved because they believed God and he gave them salvation. They weren't saved by works. Um, James is going to say their works validated their faith, 
but they were still saved by grace through faith alone. I like to put it this way, and I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't run this rabbit, but it's too good. I've got in my, in my wallet, I've got a, that's a credit card, okay? Um, Dave Ramsey would be mad that I even have that. That's another story. And, and then I've got, a, I've got a debit card, right? So, um, and you might have seen me do this in church. I think I've done this in church. The Old Testament saints, they were saved on credit, uh, they were saved looking forward to the cross, right? The payment would be made in the future for their sins, but they were still, they just believed God's word. Abraham believed and God gave him the righteousness of Christ and God literally justified King David the same way, according to the Apostle Paul. He just believed God and his transgressions were forgiven. And so they're saved looking forward to the cross. We're saved on debit looking back what Christ did. The whole transaction always comes to the Old Testament saint or the New Covenant believer by grace through faith. And, and really, that's pa what Paul is saying. That's how salvation has always been, and that's how it will always be. Verses 11 through 22, okay? Um, now, remember, Paul is dealing with a church or an area or a region of churches. Remember, the book of Ephesians, it's impersonal. It's um, probably a circular letter. So Paul probably doesn't just have one church in mind. He's got a number of churches in mind in that area. The point is, is that, again, I mentioned this at the top. One of the problems was Jew and Gentile relations in these churches. And so some of these churches were heavily, heavily, um, there were a large number, let me put it this way, of Gentiles that were in these churches. And so... You had almost a division in some of these churches. You had the Jews over here, and then you had the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And so what Paul is trying to teach them is that, first of all, you're all in the same boat. Whether you're Jew and Gentile, you're all lost, you're all saved the same way, and you're all saved for the same reason. And it's by grace through faith, no one can boast whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile. Tracking with me? So he's also wanting them to know that they now have been, both Jew and Gentile, placed into this one body called the church. And so they're not only equal in terms of their salvation and their footing there, they're equal in terms of their um, uh, relationship with one another. So watch this. What God has done in us, grace. The second part of this, what God has done between us. Okay, now, guys, when I am... Um, when I'm dealing with, if I want to deal with, for example, racism in the church, you, some of you might remember when we had COVID and all of that stuff was going on right on the heels of the Me Too movement, you had Black Lives Matter and all of that. Um, I preached a series of messages in the gym when we were over there on racism. And this is the text I, I believe, I think I walked through and one of the things that this does is it really addresses the racism issue that was in the early first church, uh, um, which is kind of redundant, but it, it, it speaks of how Jews and Gentiles, Jews and non-Jews, were going to get together. And so um, I title this section, Why We Can't Be Divided, and we can't be divided because God has broken down the wall between us. Look at what he says. Um, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, you non-Jews in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. Now, guys, again, what you want to know what the Jewish people, they considered themselves circumcised because they were children of Abraham. You want to know what they called non-Jews? Uncircumcised. It'd be like us calling, um, you know, heathen over there. We've been circumcised. We're in a right relationship with God. You Gentiles, you're uncircumcised. You're a bunch of heathen over there, um, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, okay? So God gave Abraham and his descendants the Abrahamic promise, and um, the Gentiles were on the outside looking in, and the Jews, they were, they were boastful about their salvation in God, and even though God commanded them to share salvation with the Gentiles, they frankly didn't do it. Jonah is dragged kicking and screaming because he doesn't want to preach salvation to a bunch of Gentiles. Are y'all tracking with me? So Paul is saying, 
Remember, you Gentiles, that you were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You have the haves, the Jews, or the Hebrew people, and the have-nots, you Gentiles. And you guys, were in, you didn't have any hope. Here's another pick six moment. Okay. Verse 13. But now, hallelujah. Two big buts in this chapter, right? But God in verse 4. And but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you Gentiles, you guys that were outside, you guys have been brought near. For he himself, that's Jesus, is our what? Our peace who hath made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Okay? So there was a barrier between the Jews and Gentiles that God breaks down in salvation. And now they're both not only equal, but have equal access to the living God. Okay? Now I could camp out all day on this. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? What happened... To the veil split. split what was god saying gentiles you have access to god right and literally they broke down the wall hey you had the temple you had literal walls you had an area where the jews could go in the outer court watch this you had a wall that was there for the gentiles they could only come so far and far and there was a literal wall there they found a sign that said whosoever and i'm going to paraphrase the sign whosoever crosses this wall comes comes across this line um, will find themselves being punished by death okay so in between the gentiles and the jews there was a literal wall that said you can't come here or you're gonna you're gonna die for it okay now what Paul is doing is he's playing on that and he's saying when Jesus came and saved us all the same way, he tore down those walls. There are no longer Jews and Gentiles. There is just the church made up of Jews and Gentiles, men and women, slave and free, whatever race you are, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, he says we're all on equal footing, and we all had the same access to God through Jesus Christ. Whoever they are, no matter what race they are, no matter where they are on the social economic scale, that we're all saved the same way, and we all had the same access to the living God. Nobody's got a foot up on anybody else. Think about what that does when it comes to race relations. Um, we'll, we'll continue to read here. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, there was enmity, enmity between the Jews and Gentiles, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that him, in himself he might, that's Jesus might, make the two into what? One new man, thus establishing, there it is, peace again. So the two are Jew and Gentile, he's making them one body, okay? And might reconcile them both in one body, that's the church, to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And then he quotes Isaiah 57, 19. He knows his Old Testament. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. You want to know what that means? He's saying it is prophesied in the Old Testament that Jews were going to hear the gospel and Gentiles were going to hear the gospel. Both of them were going to get the same message of peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18, for through him we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Think about that. The Jews had all of their sacrificial system, didn't they? Now what Paul is saying is in Jesus Christ, we all go to God the same way. We don't go through him, uh, to him through sacrifices. We go the same way, Jew and Gentile, through the one sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we are made one body. So then, Paul says, remember what God has done between us. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. Hey, Gentiles, you're not second-class citizens because you're not Jewish any longer. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and you are of God's household. Think about that. Now, um, 
You might have a household and you might have a natural child in that household. Then you might have a child that is a child by adoption. Okay? Um, you guys know, even under Roman law in the first century, that you could actually disown a natural child, but once you adopted a child, you could not disown that child. And that child that you adopted, and it's like this today even, he has all the rights and privileges of a natural child. That's what Paul is saying. And so there's no, he, I love this, there's not a second class citizen in God's um, church. And I love that. We're all in God's household. We're all his children. We all have the same access. We were all saved from the same thing, headed the same direction. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. I like that text that says the chief cornerstone in the King James. In whom the whole building fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Wow. Think about that. Think about that. Uh, the metaphors that are used here. One body, right? Um, broken down wall, so there's peace between you. You're in the same household. And then he says here, uh, one holy temple being built together. In other words, this, there's this idea of God putting together a building and you're a part of it. The Gentiles were brought in and they have equal footing with the Jew and the Jew was being taught. You have no right to um, reject or even pick and choose who gets into God's kingdom based on your prejudice um, attitude that you might have. And again, let me close with this. Remember Peter? Remember, you go on a little bit in the book of Acts. That great Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls are saved. Peter is used in a marvelous way. Paul comes onto the scene. Paul starts leading Gentiles to the Lord. And in the book of Galatians, um, Peter is, and by the way, Peter is having a hard time when Cornelius gets saved in the book of Acts, chapter 10. Remember, God has to lower down a sheet with a bunch of clean and unclean animals, if you will, on it. And God was teaching Peter, Peter, even the Gentiles are now considered clean in Christ Jesus. Peter's struggling with this. You remember, um, Peter's with some, some, some Gentiles and some Jews come. And it's like the, the leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention come, come, you know, from Oklahoma City. And they come and Peter all of a sudden withdraws from the Gentiles. And Paul, this is Galatians, read it, gets up in Peter's face and rebukes him. The point is, guys, Peter wrestled with this for a number of, of months, maybe even years. Um, after um, he was saved. And so Paul is addressing that in a special way. And the early church, this caused tension within the early church. But the Lord is saying, you all have equal footing at the cross. I'm building something. You don't pick and choose. Let me do my work. <music>